Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for attending this session. Gas galore, fracking and the future of energy. My name's Tony Gilland. I'm the Science and Society Director at the Institute of Ideas and also the Director of our Debating Matters competition. Uh, delighted to welcome you all. I'm not going to say much because we haven't got long, but I think it is worth saying that this is obviously uh, a very important issue in, in this country and, and, and globally. We don't need David Cameron to tell us how expensive our energy bills are. Uh, we know that. Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. But we do need the government to make some important decisions about the future of energy in this country. Uh, you may well be aware a number of electricity generating plants need to be shut down in the near future uh, and new ones put in their place. And obviously there's a big question mark over where the emphasis should be in terms of gas generation and uh, nuclear uh, uh, and, and wind power and, and sustainable energy and this sort of thing. Uh, so there's a lot of important questions that have been uh, left hanging and that need to be decided. And then to make the situation more uh, difficult, if you like, or, or encourage further uh, uncertainty, uh, we start to hear about fracking and the success of uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing in the United States, where I think it's been uh, sort of grown up quite substantially over about the last five years or so, uh, and has resulted in, in, in incredibly low uh, gas prices in the United States at the moment, supplying, I think, somewhere between a, qu a quarter or, or even more gas, natural gas, in the United States. So uh, it's actually a very important question for us to consider. So, we have three speakers. Uh, I will not do justice to them now. Uh, you can read their full biographies on the website. Uh, but in the interest of time, just to say a couple of lines about each. Uh, first, to speak on my right, very pleased to have Stephen Ball, uh, who is the uh, vice, uh, a vice president at Statoil in the United States onshore business. He works in the shale side of Statoil's business at the at present, so knows a lot about this issue. And for those that you don't know, Statoil is a Norwegian international energy company that has actually been providing a lot of gas in the UK, and you'll see a number of their adverts on the tube and elsewhere. Uh, then very pleased to have Fiona Harvey, who's the environment correspondent at The Guardian, and she joined there from the Financial Times, where she was the environment editor. She has twice won the Foreign Press Association Award for Best Environment Story and was named Environment Journalist of the Year at the British Environment and Media Awards in 2007. And we're really pleased to have Fiona with us. Uh, and kindly hopped off a plane not that many hours ago and is uh, with us after enjoying a nice time on the beach in Rio, I understand. Or, I was also, working. She was, was working. working. <laughs> Kiel University organised a conference uh, on the economy in Rio, wasn't it? That's right. Yes. <laughs> it was uh, Finally, third to speak, very pleased to have Professor Hal Thomas, who's Pro Vice Chancellor uh, for International and Engagement at the University of Cardiff, and he's also a Fellow of the Royal Academy of <coughs> Engineering. He worked on their working group that's just this year produced a very authoritative report uh, looking at some of the possible implications of fracking and how to understand some of the risks that people have raised about the, the process. <coughs> And he was elected to the very prestigious academic body uh, for scientists, the Royal Society, as a fellow for his work on geo-environmental engineering processes. Finally, I would like to give a very big thank you to the Royal Academy of Engineering, or RAENG, as I think they're more commonly referred to these days, for supporting this debate and allowing us all to learn from it and exchange our views. So, without further ado, Stephen, please. Just to say thanks to Tony for putting on this particular uh, issue up on the table for uh, hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which is probably the ugliest word you can imagine in the English language anyway. Apologies for that. I came from America. But, um, <clears throat> and particularly thank you for taking time out on your Saturdays as well to come and listen, in particularly for this debate. What I want to do is just uh, explain a bit about the uh, US context. I've been in the US for four years, working for Stato, developing our shale business in there, and we're in three different areas. In, in shale, we're in North Dakota, we're in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and also down in Texas as well. So we're uh, one of the earliest international companies to go in there. I just say we are a Norwegian energy company. We're mostly offshore. That's where we grew up in the, in the North Sea. But we see that we have to actually react to the new energy realities we have is that conventional resources are declining. And if you still want to grow your business, which you need to do as an energy company, you've got to do that in different ways. And that's through unconventionals. And one of those is shale. So what I'll do is, you know, Stato itself, we don't have any shale interest in the UK, so I'm not here to apologise about anything. Those kind of things will come out with propaganda. So I just want to come up with a sort of more nuanced discussion of what the experience has been in the US 
and if there are any lessons learnt for the US, um, I think there are some, and those are things that you don't want to do as well, and just give some context around the, the energy situation and shale globally. So, history of the first with the shale experience itself. I mean, shale has impacted the US dramatically. As Tony said, 25% of US natural gas comes from shale resources. Uh, about 2005, that was about 1%. and It's grown dramatically, but it's not a new technology, and I'll explain about that. But just to explain what shale is, Shale itself is a common type of you know, sedimentary rock. And all geologists, if there's any in the audience, you know when you drill through shale, you'll feel a puff of gas, record it, and you'll go down and find actually you know, a, a conventional sandstone where you'd prefer to be drilling from that. So we've known for decades that shale itself does have hydrocarbons. But what's been different is that uh, the application of technology is the thing that's unlocked this. And there's two things in particular. The first one is directional drilling, and the other one is hydraulic fracturing. So with hydraulic... Uh, with Directional drilling itself, this is an important piece of technology. This has mostly come from the offshore, but we would drill down and you can direct your drill bit and actually move along and actually create a longer reservoir, a well bore, inside shale. Uh, that would be the alternative to just drilling vertical wells, which is the old-fashioned way of doing things where you don't get much contact with the rock and the reservoir. So the other part about hydraulic fracturing as well is uh, this, these two events really unlocked the whole of this thing in the US and it went on very quickly in the US. Hydraulic fracturing itself is not a new technology. You know, it is an established engineering process. First well in the world was uh, fracked in, uh, in 1949. And then in the 1980s, there was developments in something called the Barnett Shale, which is around Dallas, Fort Worth area in Texas. And there was experimentation going through the whole time there. And really, when they cracked the code of actually drilling longer laterals, which, you know, the horizontal section of a well, and also by fracturing and learning different new techniques of how to do this properly, it unlocked it economically. And obviously, it's got to be economic for this to, to work. So what we do is, from that point there, you can see in the US, there are over one million wells have been hydraulically fractured. Uh, there's a huge amount of information and data around it. And I so said, this is something that's not going away. This is the future of American gas. Probably half of American gas is going to come from shale rock within the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, in the UK as well, just to sort of give you a little bit of context, I mean, there's most UK, as you know, it, it's, the, it's the offshore and the North Sea is the main thing, but there are 2,000 wells, hydraulically fractured onshore wells in the UK, of which about 200 of those have actually been hydraulically fractured over the last 20 years. And in Germany as well, they've been hydraulically fracturing uh, wells in, the, in uh, regions there for just over 20 years as well with, no, you know, no detrimental effect. So let me explain a little bit about the, the natural gas development process itself, because I just want to give you an idea of how, how this actually works in practice. So we take the assumption first is that we've done our geological surveys and we think the rock is good. But we do that, before we do that anywhere, we'd have to get some permitting going on. And permitting is not just to go through the federal or the, the local authorities, you have to do community engagement as well. And with the community engagement, you'd need to have a full environmental development plan. You'd have to have water management as well, and also some local impact studies of how you would be affecting the local environment. So let me explain then. Once we've got these together, we've actually got the permits, and we've got the right to do that, and we've earned, you know, hopefully some support in local areas to, to do drilling. And often there is a lot of local support, but there are controversies as well, there's no doubt. What we do is we actually create a pad, and a pad itself, we call a drill pad, is just less than the size of a football field. And what we do on the pad, we'll have a, a directional uh, uh, drill itself on there. And we'll be drilling down about 1,500 to 3,000 uh, meters down into the depth of the rocks. And then we'll horizontally, we'll curve that well bore and we'll actually drill another 1,500, 3,000 meters, creating that, that horizontal section. And it's down in the horizontal section, you know, three kilometers down in the ground. That's where the hydraulic fracturing occurs. And what you do is you'll send electrical charges down across the bottom of the well bore. It will crack the rocks themselves. And then we'll pump down water and sand and some other additives as well that we need in there. This is the chemicals. I'll talk about those that we have chemicals. But it's 99.5% is water and sand. You run down. And some chemicals, which is swimming pool cleaner, it's guar gum, it's to get, to get the, the sand and rock moving. And you pump this down into the well bore as hard as you can, high pressure it there. And this will crack the, ra the rocks in that we've already made in there. So it will crack and create new fractures. Now, the sand itself, we call it propant because it props open the gaps. And really, what we're doing is we're, we're creating new fractures and gaps. The sand will come in between. Rock pressure will pull back together. And then there's gaps in between the rocks. And the sand will create, actually, itself a reservoir. And you can produce gas from that. So the water will, be, will pump up to the surface. We recycle the water, usually in closed loop. So we can actually use that water again for other frac jobs and then you'll have gas production there. So the actual drilling itself, you drill a one well takes about 20 days. To fracture a well takes two days. 
And after that, that well will produce for 30 to 40 years. So the actual impact time is very, very short uh, you know, in the local area on those areas. So just to go, what's, the, what's shale gas done to the, to the US? I mean, first, energy security. Let's not go into the politics of US energy, but it's, it's an important thing for the US. It's got 100 years of gas uh, now. It's got the cheapest gas in the world as well. It costs about, what, a third of what we're paying in the UK for natural gas at the moment. And also you've seen a renaissance in US industry. Petrochemical companies are coming back. They're investing a lot more again because of cheap gas. Steel production is up 8%. We use a lot of steel in the oil and gas industry, naturally enough, and steel production is up. And also, you can see that one in 10 jobs in 2011 was actually created by, by the oil and gas industry. Applications for engineering and petroleum engineering has increased at universities. I travel to a lot of universities in the US, and it's, it's a huge uh, amount of area and uh, R&D investment. And finally, carbon dioxide emissions have dropped in the US. They're actually the lowest since 1992, and that's because gas has actually outcompeted coal when it comes to cost. So the public perception, the, you know, the industry, in all honesty, when I look at it as a, as a Brit as well, have not done a good job to, to deal with this. In the US, there's a love-hate relationship with uh, the industry. And, uh, and I think particularly, that's the difficulty. It goes down Democratic and Republican lines. But the industry did get its act together, helped to come with um, uh, some of the best practice that it has in the industry, some minimum standards. And you know, we're, we're all measured by uh, the mistakes that are made by other companies. And also has done the same for, uh, for the regulatory environment as well. The regulatory, regulatory environment in the US is pretty difficult. And uh, difficult to understand, but we can discuss that a little bit more. Just to finalise here, I mean, shale is everywhere. You're going to find it all over the world. There are many other countries, Australia, into China, who are developing this. And, uh, and it really is, you know, something you, you can't stop up when it comes to development for energy and the requirements for energy. You can do it right. You can do it the good way. It could be a, a possibility for the US, uh, for, for the UK itself. And... Um, and there are lessons learned. It's not the silver bullet answer to the UK energy problem, not at all, but it could be at least encouraged as a part of development of industry in the, U in the UK. I'd like to ask, has anyone actually ever been to a, a fracking site? Um, oh, we have a few. Excellent. Okay. Um, then you'll know. I, I, I have uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, then you'll know, uh, the few of you who have, um, that the uh, actual uh, immediate uh, impact uh, of, of this uh, fracking um, isn't really much to look at. Um, uh, the uh, field that uh, the fracking site I've been to up in uh, Lancashire in, uh, near a village called Singleton um, which is one of Quadrilla's sites uh, in the UK uh, it's a field maybe about sort of uh, four, four times the size of this room roughly um, and at the time when they were uh, first uh, drilling uh, there was a, a massive machine there um, it was about the size of a big crane and it, it was doing uh, what we've just uh, heard described it was actually quite compact, really. It went up quite a, a big way in the air, but um, it would have, in terms of the, the machine itself, would easily have, the footprint would have easily fitted into this room. What uh, was the reaction uh, of the local people? Well, um, everyone uh, that I spoke to uh, was concerned. Now, in a way, that's a bit sort of uh, self-fulfilling, as uh, most people uh, who choose to speak to a journalist uh, do so because they've got some kind of concern. Um, and although I sort of, you know, I did try and get a sort of cross-section uh, of opinion, quite possibly some of the people who didn't want to speak to me didn't want to because they, they, they didn't really care. Um, so it's difficult to, to get a very accurate measure, but I can tell you that, that uh, there was a lot of people in that village uh, who were dead set against this. Um, I returned uh, several months later and um, the field was empty, uh, apart from uh, a small, uh, as you've just heard, um, it is a sort of, a, a, I think they call it the, the, the cap, um, and it was a sort of small structure, uh, maybe as tall as this room, uh, and it was only, I mean, you know, it, it, it was about sort of uh, 10 feet uh, by 10 feet, really. It wasn't really much, uh, much to see. Uh, I went to talk to the villagers again, um, and even though this kind of massive structure disappeared, leaving behind, you know, an empty field with a, a, a very small structure in it, about the size of a, a shed, um, people were still dead set against it. And one of the reasons they were dead set against it um, is that there had been two earthquakes uh, in the area and these two earthquakes uh, we now know and we know uh, from studies done by the Royal Academy of Engineering and uh, others um, that those uh, uh, earthquakes were caused by the fracking. Um, they were very minor earthquakes, you know, enough to rattle your teacups, uh, enough to sort of, you know, w w wake people up, uh, but not, certainly not uh, anywhere near enough to, to do any, any real damage. Um, that experience, my, my experience of going to the, uh, the fracking site, uh, has convinced me 
um, absolutely that um, fracking will only ever be a very small minority interest in this country. Um, I can't imagine that there will be any more uh, than a handful uh, of fracking sites uh, in the UK and anyone who thinks that uh, shale gas is going to bring down our energy bills uh, frankly has been sniffing too much gas um, because it's the UK is not Wyoming uh, for a lot of reasons and uh, we're not going to be to, to be doing it um, uh, uh, in this crowded island uh, to any great extent. Um, the arguments for uh, shale gas, you've just heard some of them, um, are that it, uh, it brings down uh, carbon dioxide emissions, it provides a cheap source of energy, um, and it, uh, it creates jobs, uh, and so on. Um, in the UK, uh, this uh, isn't going to be the case because um, uh, we, uh, we, we, are, we have too many NIMBYs uh, in this country, to be frank, to allow uh, shale gas uh, fracturing to happen on, on, on any sort of scale uh, that would achieve any of those three uh, supposed goods. Um, the advantages that we've just heard outlined in terms of shale gas are in any case rather questionable. Um, the idea that shale gas brings down carbon dioxide uh, emissions, for instance, um, is uh, just not true. Um, partly this is because uh, shale gas uh, fracturing itself uh, produces uh, a lot of uh, fugitive methane emissions, as they're called in the jargon, which basically means leaks. Uh, the gas itself kind of uh, can leak out of these uh, out of these uh, these fractures um, and just gets into the atmosphere. And methane, although it's, uh, it stays around in the atmosphere for a, a shorter time than, than carbon dioxide, um, it uh, is a, a far more potent greenhouse gas uh, than carbon dioxide while it's around. Um, the other reason why it doesn't bring down carbon dioxide emissions is if you look at the experience of the US, and we've just heard they've got the lowest greenhouse gas emissions since the early 90s. That's true. That's great for the United States. What has happened to all that coal? Guess what? We're burning it here. Um, so Europe's uh, carbon dioxide emissions have increased because we are now burning cheap coal that the US doesn't want. Um, and so are other countries around the world. Um, so uh, in terms of sort of, you know, global... Uh, climate change, it's a bit of a zero-sum game. You don't really uh, get uh, environmental uh, benefits. Uh, in terms of the other environmental problems associated with shale gas, well, in the US, we've seen a lot of problems in terms of contamination uh, of water, uh, of um, pollution, uh, not just of, of, of water supplies, but, but, uh, but of the surrounding area. Um, and we've seen uh, very intensive uh, industrial activity. Now, we're not going to see that in the UK to that extent. And some of the reasons are, are geological. Um, the areas where it would be done in the UK, um, probably it, 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 it is very unlikely to actually um, affect uh, the uh, water supply here. We, 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 we just don't do it in the same way. Um, also, it's more tightly regulated here. However, and I don't have time to go into this uh, now, but I, um, uh, no doubt in the questions I'll be able to bring it up. There are uh, serious issues around the regulation uh, of shale gas in the UK and the um, experiences we've had so far uh, from, from Quadrilla, although uh, studies uh, as, that I've referred to by the Royal Academy uh, of Engineering and others um, have showed that it is broadly safe, there are some serious questions around the way it has been done um, by Quadrilla, and those questions have not yet been answered, and I'll happily talk about them later. Thanks. Yeah, first of all, let me say I'm pleased to be here. As has already been said, I'm here representing really a group of other people. This is the working group that produced a report that was published. It's a, a report from the jo Joint Academies report. It's the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. The Royal Academy of Engineering, you can see there. These were an independent group of people. Um, Basically, the starting point for me and in, in, in my work in this area was when I got the invitation to join that working group. I'm not, a, I'm not an academic with a, a track record of publications in fracking or anything like that. I'm a geotechnical engineer with an interest in the way that um, water flows below ground and other materials, other things happen below ground. Um, and as I said, this, my, my involvement really started with the invitation to join the working group. It was chaired by a, by a colleague from the University of Cambridge, and there were eight of us on the group uh, that came together. Um, some had a background of interest and in work in shale gas, but 
others came from the seismicity background, from earthquakes background, and others came from groundwater and environmental background. And the starting point really was a request from the government, from the UK government, for an independent assessment of the very, very point that, uh, that uh, Fiona's just talked about, and that is, what about these earthquakes and what about the groundwater pollution that's caused by fracking? And so we had a very specific remit, very specific question, quite a short time scale to come up with an answer. And we did our work by um, a, a series of evidence gathering sessions. We had eight of those sessions. Um, and basically, at the end of that, we produced a report. We had five months to do so, so I, I wouldn't want you to think that this was a, a, a deeply sort of, you know, a PhD thesis kind of approach, you know, three, four, five postdocs working on it or anything like that. This is, this is what this is. This is bringing all this together. And the headline messages of, that we conclude from our work are very simple. Um, and I've, there's, a, there's a lot of, of sort of, you know, second level headline messages, which I don't think we'll have time to go into today unless you particularly want to in the questioning. But the main is, question is the fracking can be undertaken safely here in the UK if best practice can be effectively um, reg regulated and enforced. Um, I think the main thing, the main message I want to try and get across to you is that, uh, you know, uh, we didn't feel that the bigger dangers, um, and our dangers is the wrong word to use, but the bigger risks really were associated with with uh, so-called earthquakes, and, and, and we think earthquakes is the wrong word to use anyway. These are tremors. These are, you wouldn't feel them. They're very, very small. Um, um, the quadrilla experience is slightly different because there is an issue there. Um, and we didn't also feel that uh, groundwater pollution is the, is the issue. And in very simple terms, um, if you can imagine, just for one moment, three kilometers below ground, you know, you or I happen to be down there at some point or other, and just imagine the mass of rock and so on above you, um, you know, just imagine sort of things coming up through that three kilometers of rock. And it's not easy. Um, the biggest problems will arise, we felt, um, the very point where you drill through all that material to get at the shale. Um, and this is a very, very well known fact that, you know, when you drill, obviously when you drill a hole through the ground, you create, uh, you create a sort of shortcut, don't you? You create a, you know, a, a route back for pollutants and so on and so forth. Now, the drilling industry is very mature and very well established, and they have, a, they have, uh, we accept a rigorous way of, uh, of producing drilling rigs, uh, producing wells. Probably this is why the, you know, the steel production issue is significant. Um, but we felt as a group that the well, integrity issue was the issue the UK needed to focus more on, um, and that to make sure that um, that the practices that are currently used in the offshore industry are improved and developed further. Now, I could go into a lot of those sort of technical details. It comes into the regulatory regime of the UK, um, but that's essentially where, you know, as a headline message, where our group tended to focus uh, our recommendations. We produced a report, we sent the recommendations back to Sir John Beddington, the Chief Scientific Advisor, who's uh, taken it back to government. And we're literally within weeks, I think, of getting a response from government um, as to you know, their reaction to that. The biggest problem we, would, we have in many ways in deciding what to do about this is we don't know how big an industry this is going to be. Nobody knows, frankly. You know, are we, you know, are we talking about, you know, turning the UK into a major sort of, you know, gas exploration area, or is it going to be so insignificant that nobody's going to notice it? Um, and I think one of the questions we had was, you know, do we feel that the regulatory regime that we proposed is kind of too burdensome if it's just going to be the odd drilling rig here and there? And in that sense, I think, you know, it'd be useful maybe in the debate to separate out the sort of uh, so-called exploration phase where people actually do decide whether there is, is possible to do this um, and, uh, and a production phase that might follow. Um, so essentially, I think those are, the, those are the high level messages that I wanted to say. The other area that, there are, that our, our study was restricted, as I've already told you, was very specific um, and we acknowledge that. We, we didn't look at the whole climate change agenda issue. Um, we acknowledge, of course, um, that this is still a fossil fuel, and so the impact on the climate change agenda, uh, on the renewables, 
is, uh, you know, potentially significant. It certainly is significant in the U.S. It's even an impact on the on the nuclear program in the U.S. And above all, I mean, I think, you know, our view was that there needed to be a lot more research done in particular on the social acceptance agenda. So I can relate very strongly to the point that was made about social acceptance. Uh, finally, I would say, you know, we really do, do need to think of the, about this in the UK context. Of course, we need to learn lessons from mistakes that have happened in the US. But the UK is not the US. You know, the whole system is different. People can't at the moment with the Environment Agency. People couldn't frack under a, um, under a water table and uh, under an aquifer because they'd have to get the permission from the Environment Agency. And it's not at the moment it's inconceivable the agency would give them permission to do so. So the very problems that you, you heard about in the, U, in the US almost can't happen in the UK, um, you know, as things stand at the moment. Having said that, we recognize the risks. There are risks involved. Nobody knows exactly what happens below ground. So we introduced, we proposed a traffic light system for the, um, for the, for the fracking itself so that if you, if you can sense any tremors, um, it's stopped. Can I ask that we leave just for the moment to one side the climate change issue, that we come back to that. Uh, and you said, well, it's not get real. This is not going to bring down uh, uh, gas prices in the UK. Again, leaving aside economic recoverability, which we don't yet know about, and we can come back to that as well, you specifically raised the question of nimbyism. Yeah? So all these villages, even when uh, it shrunk from a football pitch to a 10 by 10 shed or whatever it is that you referred to, they still didn't like it. Yeah? You seem to present that as an uh, 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 irresolvable problem, barrier. It's just not going to happen. Doesn't that seem quite closed-minded that if actually the industry does follow best practice, if the industry uh, uh, engages with local people uh, in a, an effective way, in a sort of, you know, without being too arrogant or dismissive or whatever, if it gets its communication job right and its industrial practice right, why wouldn't people look at this more positively as a source of potentially much cheaper energy and also as a source of uh, 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 employment and benefit to the community? When you talk about being closed-minded, um, it, 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 it's not me who's being closed-minded, um, but I, I can tell you that, that people just will not accept this. Um, let, let, let me just... Uh, uh, give you the, the, the experience uh, that I had when I was there. I was talking to some people, we were standing beside this, this field that I've described and so on. They had just come out of a meeting with Quadrilla, the company. They had just been shown around the site. that have everything explained to them in great detail. That, you know, that they'd had an hour's kind of briefing, just as, as we've had uh, uh, very condensed there into what uh, shale gas drilling is and so on. Um, and they still didn't like it. And um, they pointed, we were standing in this field, and they, they, they pointed to kind of, uh, you know, a, a field uh, uh, in the distance um, and they said, you know, they were going to try and build uh, 100 houses there, and we managed to stop them. Um, and that, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but, oh, my heart sank. Um, because if we can't even build houses in this country, and people are desperate for houses, you know, we, we, we're just not building the houses that people need to live in. We can't even get houses built uh, in this country because people, uh, you know, who already enjoy uh, a nice life in the countryside don't want anyone else uh, to join them, um, then how on earth are we going to get, uh, get these shale gas wells uh, uh, drilled? I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, the, um, the people don't like the industrialization uh, of the countryside. I mean, um, you know, if you were trying to, 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 to build, you know, the, the, the coal mines, the steel mills, the, the, all the, uh, the infrastructure that we had with the Industrial Revolution, uh, if you were trying to do that today, it just wouldn't happen at all. Um, and partly that's because we're far more densely populated uh, today. Um, but it's also that, that, that people um, you're about people don't villages. like it. I'm talking about villages in the so countryside. It's a I mean, you're not, you're not going to. Bit. I'm yeah, not I mean, you're, you're, you're not going to drill for shale gas in the garden there. You know, you, you, you drill for shale gas, you know, um, in the, the, the countryside in this country. But um, the problem is that anywhere that you could drill for, for shale gas uh, in this country, you have to do it quite intensively. So, so this one field that I was talking about. Um, uh, I was told by Quadrilla that you'd need about 68 uh, of those per square mile uh, in order to do uh, the drilling uh, effectively. So that's quite a lot, that, uh, you know, in, in a small area. Um, and there's nowhere in, this, in, in, in the UK that you... Well, nowhere that there is shale gas in the UK uh, that's recoverable, uh, that you could do that without being very close uh, to some village or other. 
And, you know, I've been to town hall meetings at, at other places where this has been proposed, and people don't want it. You can't get wind farms built in this country. You can't get houses built. How on earth do you think you're going to have a, a big well um, that, that, that causes earthquakes? How on earth do you think you're going to get that built? Anywhere here. It's not going to happen. Right. I think that's a little pessimistic. I mean, uh, uh, it is going to be difficult for certain. I mean, the, and you know, our group certainly acknowledge the social acceptance issue is the huge issue. There's no question about that. Um, but you know, it's cheap-ish energy, and you know, how are you going to? You know, where are we going to get our our energy from? Of course, you're you're right, Fiona. We go off, go off, go into the North Sea and build the wind farms. They're horrendously expensive. The cost of that electricity is really, really expensive. You build a seven barrage in my part of the world, you can build it, you can borrow the money, I'm sure. Uh, we could as a country, but the cost of the electricity would be huge. Somebody's going to have to pay for that. So that's the dilemma, and that'll, that'll be the, uh, I think, as you started. And, and please remember, as our chairman said, you know, Coal fire power stations are going to be closing down. Ditko's closing soon, and Aberthaw in South Wales is closing soon. And you, you're going to need some power stations to back up the wind farms when the wind doesn't blow anyway. So, you know, what are we going to, what are we going to do? How are we going to get that energy? Um, I, don't th I think some of those arguments will start to, to roll a little bit more strongly, whether it'll go in the direction of shale gas or whether other unconventionals, I don't know. Or maybe coal, clean, clean coal will come back. As you can tell from my accent, I come from a part of the world where this cold. Uh, Stephen, can you address this question as well uh, from your experience and, and what you think in terms of the possibility of overcoming this challenge or reaction or response uh, in the UK? Uh, but also, once you've done that, moving a little on to the climate change question, because I think cost is a big factor and, and people are very aware of how high energy costs are. But the climate change issue hasn't completely gone away, not least in the form of the Climate Change Act 2008, which puts a legal requirement on the government, I believe, uh, uh, to meet its emissions targets that it signed up to in Europe. Uh, and I think the Climate Change Committee has said if we go down this route, not just of, of uh, getting gas from fracking, but more gas in general, it's, it will actually be illegal. The government won't be able to meet its targets. So the climate change question is important, and I think uh, Fiona raised this question about methane leaks that you might want to respond to. So first NIMBYism, then climate change. Um, NIMBYism isn't just exclusive in the UK, it's, uh, you get a lot of it in the US as well. Nobody wants a nuclear power station near them. Nobody wants an LNG, you know, na liquefied natural gas export facility down their road. You know, it is, it's all over the place, but obviously, you know, it's the size and scale of the US, which is, you know, different to the UK. Um, one particular state is Pennsylvania, where, for example, if you drew some analogues, I think they would be useful. Don't use Texas, because they're so used to the oil and gas industry, you know, and so many people, hundreds of thousands of people rely on there lifestyle for it, so uh, they, they kind of understand it. But in Pennsylvania, they did have the first ever gas well in the US was drilled in the 1850s. In Pennsylvania, it started off for a while, went very dead. And then uh, this all came up again in the Marcellus, where we see that it's, it's a huge, huge, massive gas play out in the whole area, in uh, going through Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania's you know, high unemployment in the area there. It's, uh, it's got some of the, some, you know, some of the worst uh, Schooling, it's uh, one of the highest obesity rates. It's, you know, it's a, a state with a lot of difficulties and problems. So the, the, you know, actually most of the industry itself and push from the state as well actually started with a taxation there, 67% taxation uh, for the area. And that was uh, ring fence that it would have to be used on infrastructure developments in the area, which is you know, highly sort of undeveloped infrastructure in that particular part of the US. So you do see some extra benefits going through there in scale. And also, you know, there are methods of drilling and fracturing, which actually, you know, you can deal with urban environments. If you've, any of you ever been to Dallas-Fort Worth area, that's where it all kicked off in the Barnett Shale. You know, there are, there are sort of drilling underneath the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, airport. There's actually, they're in close to, you know, in, in close to schools as well. There actually is permitted there. They use electrical rigs so it doesn't smell of diesel. You know, there are other ways of technology of doing this and with smaller footprints as well in the environment. Okay. And on the climate change? On the climate change, I mean, you know, Fiona's right. You know, there is an issue of fugitive gas. And what we have is what we're kind of lacking in the U.S. is an apple-to-apple -apple, uh, comparison of what that is. And let me just explain. When you're drilling, and you know, I said we've fracked down here, we've got the gas coming back up, and the water's coming up with it as well. Previously, so in the U.S., they've been either flaring that gas, you know, but burning it off until the well cleans up for about two or three days, and then, then you cap it, and then you'll get it on the pipeline. Uh, they've been, you know, previously been doing that. The Environmental Protection Agency 
in the US actually said, you know, this has got to stop. And also, you know, if it, from an economic point of view, it, why waste a load of gas as well? It's actually money being burnt. So they've started with green completions as well, where you actually have to cap this and split it. It's not very difficult technology to split the water and the gas, and you actually have to, you know, take the gas back in after a completion. So that reduces it. But there are nine big studies going on now from Stanford, UT Texas, you know, lots of different universities plus industry studies looking at, you know, where you can measure fugitive gas. If there is a, a you know, methane leakage at all, you can actually measure this with, uh, with you know, easy, easy infrared technology and actually reduce this and, and adjust it. And the industry will do that. It will make efforts to do that because it's economic for them. If there's a lot of potential, say, in France and Germany and Russia for fracking, wouldn't this still have a big impact on gas prices and, and the UK's energy supplies anyway, just because it would affect the whole market? Um, you talked about the effect on climate change, but could you say a little bit about the direct environmental impact in the area where fracking takes place, please? Both Fiona and... Um, um, sorry, I forgot his name. Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, yeah, yes. thank you. This is just a question for Fiona. For clarity, um, are you a campaigner against uh, fracking and against shale gas? Is, uh, is the Guardian a campaigner against it, or are you just trying to report uh, independently, if you like, all the pros and cons and leave it to the Guardian readers to decide what they think? I just want to make a point about um, burning gas in the US, meaning that they're shipping their coal over here. Well, if it's a clean way of producing energy, surely that means that we should all be trying to do that. You know, just because we're going to burn more coal doesn't mean it's not a good reason to burn gas where we can and reduce our emissions that way. I just wanted to ask Stephen about the market in, in America. Uh, it's de decreased the gas price a lot recently, but I've noticed it's creeping up again. Is there a sense that it's maybe been artificially low because of a, a rush to get a shale gas and with new completion technologies? Uh, will that creep up again or will it stay low? Yeah, I'd like to ask the guy from Statoil about um, coal bed methane fracking and the uh, chap from Wales, could it regenerate the areas devastated, like the old coal villages in it? Yeah, yeah to answer that uh, direct question, no, I, I'm not a campaigner, uh, I'm a journalist, uh, and it's my job to report uh, what I find. Um, the Guardian doesn't have a, a fixed position uh, on this, it wouldn't affect me anyway because I'm a news reporter, um, it's not my job uh, to have an opinion, that's for leader writers. Um, and on our pages, uh, on our opinion pages, you will have seen uh, various uh, people uh, weighing into this argument for and against uh, fracking, um, and that's where that uh, debate is being played out. My job is to is, is to report on on you know the facts and on, on what people are saying. And um, on this panel, uh, I, my job is to be sort of provocative, um, and I'm probably the person most likely to put uh, the arguments against uh, fracking, seeing as we've got someone from the oil industry. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, someone who's, who's, who's interested in, in it from a, a, an academic point of view. So, um, you know, so one, one of the reasons I'm sitting here is so that I can put uh, some of the arguments about why people are afraid of this. One of the issues that, that, that people are worried about uh, was uh, asked over here about the sort of the effects of uh, the actual immediate sort of environmental effects uh, of shale gas drilling. And although the studies have found uh, that have been carried out in this on, on how it's uh, conducted in the UK, the studies have found that it is uh, broadly safe and can go ahead. And, and you know, the, the, these studies carried out on behalf of the government and independently um, have found that, that fracking should be allowed uh, to go ahead. There is still uh, a big question there, where the, the place that I mentioned where Quadrilla is drilling, um, it's very unlikely that there would be uh, serious issues with, with water pollution because uh, the aquifer there uh, is not, is a, it's a saline aquifer, um, and the, um, the uh, drilling goes uh, sort of right through it, um, and that aquifer is not used for the local water supply. Um, so the, the issues of, of sort of uh, water pollution there um, are likely to be, you know, very limited, even if there was uh, a problem. The problem that has come up, though, um, that I think has not been answered uh, by Quadrilla, the company doing this, um, in, in uh, those wells, is that the earthquake that was caused by uh, the drilling, that's, that's been, been proved by these studies, um, the, those earthquakes actually weren't a problem in themselves, as, as I've explained, you know, a bit of teacup rattling, but the problem with them is that they damaged uh, the uh, well. The, 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 the studies showed that um, the well itself, this kind of long well, was actually deformed. Uh, there, there was serious measurable uh, deformation caused by the earthquakes. Now, 
in itself, that's not necessarily a problem. A well can be, um, you know, a bit deformed without, uh, without it being, its integrity being seriously compromised. However, um, Quadrilla has not yet fully explained how it will manage to preserve uh, the well integrity in a situation where there could be more uh, earthquakes like that, that that have all that already been proven to, to deform uh, the well that they've they've drilled so far. Um, so that that question of, of, of well integrity is the key one um, that still has to be answered. The question uh, uh, from the gentleman here about um, wouldn't it, if we've got a lot of shale gas in the world, wouldn't that bring bring down uh, gas prices for everyone? You'd have thought so, wouldn't you? However. Um, the uh, latest study by the International Energy Agency um, has shown that um, although the US now gets, I think it's 25% of its en energy you said, from, um, uh, from shale gas, um, the US is now operating, uh, in their words, as a gas island. So the price uh, of gas has come down uh, considerably in the US, uh, but that has not had, had an effect on world uh, prices, even though, you know, the, the amount of, of, of gas coming out of the U US is now huge. That has had an effect on US prices, but not on world prices because it isn't really being exported. Now, obviously, if the same experience of the US is repeated uh, on that scale in other countries, in, in China uh, or uh, in Europe, it's mainly Poland uh, that, that's got uh, shale gas, then you might expect to see uh, an effect on prices, but, but maybe not. Because um, if you do this in, in China, all that's going to happen is that you'll get, you know, uh, much lower uh, gas prices uh, in China. But China has such an enormous demand and continuing demand uh, for energy anyway that that's probably all going to be soaked up by the Chinese. Don't, don't imagine that this is going to uh, bring down gas prices for everyone because our experience show, so far shows that it doesn't. I think it's true to say that the Americans are now changing their import facilities for LNG, they're actually in the process of converting those into some of them into export facilities so that they can export some of their gas. But you can't just change that overnight and that's a process that's undertaken. What impact that will have, sorry, I don't know, but you know, you can, with this advanced technology, you can at least transport gas, as, as you know, as we do here in Britain, bring it in through Pembroke. Shale gas is just part of a sort of wider family of, uh, of, of gas that, you know, is called tight gas or unconventional gas. Cobate methane is included in that. Uh, will it help with the regeneration? I, frankly, I think, you know, we, you know, speak for the South Wales area, for what I know, that there, is, there is just as much opposition, even in former coal areas, to coal coming back or anything like that coming back. The whole point about becoming more industrial, despite the level of poverty that exists up there, the assembly members would campaign quite strongly for clean industry, not so-called dirty industry. So I think the point that's made about the, the social acceptance and, the, and, you know, and, and you know, what's needed to overcome these is very real. Because, you know, as you can obviously know, the, some of the heritage that's left from the coal industry, you know, the Aberfan disaster in particular, doesn't go away. So those people, some of those people are still alive. And do you have any feel for the opportunity here? Because one of the things that seems to be unknown is it's clear there's a lot of gas down there, but whether it's economically recoverable. Well, nobody knows. That's the whole point. You don't know until you drill a hole in the ground and you take those samples and you test them. The only people who really know what's happening in the UK at the moment are quadrilla. But the number of holes that have been drilled are very limited. And this is what I was saying at the beginning. We do not know how big, a, how big an issue, which is why some of the work in our report was challenged as being, do you really need to be this kind of, you know, careful and worried about things if it's only going to be a couple of boreholes here and a couple of holes here and there? That's, that, I think, is, would be useful to have a conversation which separates the exploration phase from the production phase, because until you do the exploration, you don't know. That first one about, um, you know, understanding the exploration phase. We call it delineation in a field. And, you know, these gas fields expectation are they're large because we can see the shale in the seismic. But we don't know if it's actually going to work or not, whether we actually, will it produce hydrocarbons? You know, will, is it too difficult? Is it too tight, the rock there? Because the idea of this shale is it's impermeable rock. We're going to drill through it. So you do actually have to stick a, a, you know, a drill bit through it and you have to hydraulic fracture it and you have to go back and do our geological models and we go back and analyze it and then we do it somewhere else, I do it somewhere else and we can draw out our maps from there. So you know, until we know that in the UK, we, we just won't know and it's several years before you'll actually see potential development because it would take at least two years to actually do the exploration work and to actually understand the Boland Shell, for example, in Lancashire. But a few other questions, there's a sort of potpourri of questions. US gas prices are going up a little bit um, Natural gas prices, they were down at sort of 
I mean, if you put it in perspective, $2 for the average gas price for the last 20 years has probably been at $6. It went down to under $2. So it's basically a third of what we're paying in the UK and Europe. Um, prices are a little bit up there because they've turned off the drill rigs. You know, if, if you can't make money, then you're not going to drill. Uh, you'll only do it where there is economic to drill. But those gas prices are staying low. And you're, you're right, no, they are artificially low in a sense because you can't export out of the US at the moment. It will come. And, you know, this, the, that's the thing about the shale development. We, you know, Australia's developing shale, Argentina's developing shale, Ukraine wants to develop it, Poland, you know, you name it, there's a plethora of countries that want to develop shale. Even if we don't develop much in the UK, the spin-off effect, hopefully, is that we will see more energy security around, because you'll see more sources of LNG to the UK rather than just uh, uh, defining on a few countries that we have. So more US gas, natural gas comes out to the UK could be actually a benefit, and you could see that globally as well. It's all about energy security, really. Fiona seems to have this council of despair that this is just not going to happen. So my question is, how can this argument be won? So you've talked about the necessity for social acceptance. So how do you make that argument? And is it just a responsibility of all companies to make that argument? Or should it be policy makers as well? It seems to me that one of the points here is there's a continued paralysis uh, in politics and policy making about doing anything, actually. Uh, so the moment that you start talking about uh, one type of energy... Uh, innovation, uh, the argument turns almost immediately to saying, well, that's taking investment and uh, initiative away from something else. But isn't it not actually not the case that in reality very little is happening? And that uh, what is actually happening is that uh, energy producing plant is going to be decommissioned and the prices will absolutely rise in the future. So um, could the panel say something a little bit about how they approach um, not just the... I mean, it's always easy to blame NIMBYs, but they're not in government. Right? And they only operate on the basis of the uh, culture of planning legislation we have in this country. So could the panel talk a little bit more or, uh, about their impressions on how to uh, deal with what is effectively a crisis in political leadership? Okay, very interesting point. Thank you. Then behind you, again. I was going to make a very similar point, actually. Um, but that um, isn't the problem that we've allowed um, you know, people, NIMBYs, as it were, to, to drive the debate rather than... Um, you know, uh, uh, looking for leadership at the, at the national level. And, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't blame um, people for being anti-development. And, and as Fiona rightly pointed out, whether it's, whether it's houses, whether it's trains, it seems to be this, a similar um, pattern occurring. And that's, you know, if I lived in the countryside and I, I had a, you know, train coming through, I'd be, I might be against it as well. But the point is that they aren't the people who necessarily should be deciding on things that, that are of national interest. Um, just a quick question, which... Uh, as time, could somebody address? Um, obviously, in the US, um, there have been instances where um, gas has got into the water supply. So, um, could, could you address how that's happened and how it can be avoided? I just wondered if there was a concern that the UK is trying to invest in so many different areas of energy, nuclear, but it's not going very well, offshore renewables, um, wind farms, nobody really wants them either. Do you think there's an issue of the UK trying to be world leaders in everything and there's maybe an argument for investing in one thing and doing it properly? Just in question of, um, you talk about energy security, and you say that this could take seven years to actually put in place. Um, and I, from what I understand, by about 2015, we're going to lose some like um, a 30% of our energy, is that right? And I've read reports that uh, they believe that things like offshore wind farms will probably generate most of the, 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 sort of the remainder that we need. So I'm just wondering, why are we having a fossil fuel fix when we should be turning into more greener, my question is about uh, the possibility of groundwater contamination as well, and it might be a quick one to answer as it's a technical one. As I understand that a lot of the chemicals or some of the chemicals that are mixed with water in the fracking are proprietary, it would be difficult to test for them um, as you don't know what you're looking for. So what are some of the ways that communities are able to test if there's contamination when they don't know what chemicals to look for? Uh, is there any form of energy that, that isn't controversial? And so the other thing is, uh, are we going to say, um, um, if gas, gas prices come down, is the solution actually either to import our electricity through, um, through the channel uh, or to um, import gas and hopefully with enough sources that, it's, um, um, you know, that, 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 it, that it will be fairly, uh, fairly reliable to find other words, sort of give up on them generating energy um, in this country? Uh, this is for Fiona. A YouGov poll in November... 2010 found that 74% of those polled supported the death penalty in certain circumstances. Do you uh, go along with that, the way you do with NIMBYs? Or uh, do you think that, as a completely neutral news journalist, 
it's your task to uh, try to persuade people to take the longer, wider view. This point about uh, NIMBYs is a bit of a, a distraction, especially with respect to wind farms and wind turbines. In fact, the number of wind turbines that have been built is half the number that have been given planning consent. So there's no argument that could be made that NIMBYs have held up uh, the, the development of wind farms in the country. Okay, thank you. Right, so I think that's an important question, particularly perhaps for Hal and Fiona, because you've both engaged a lot about both NIMBYism, but also you know, whether you've, it's been exaggerated its influence, but also this point earlier about crisis of political leadership. Is that the problem that we've got? Uh, in relation to taking things forward or not. How? Yeah. This, this is not a subject we studied in the working group of the Royal Society and <laughs> Royal Academy of Engineering, so I'm going offline here. <laughs> Personally, I think price needs to come into all this. I mean, you saw, we all saw how David Cameron reacted recently. I mean, you know, what is that ex old expression? You know, politicians sort of see the light when they feel the heat. If the prices keep going up, hopefully some of the, we will get political leadership because you know, my understanding is that the cost of some of this electricity that we are talking about today is going to be incredibly expensive. Now, I don't have all the figures. You're probably, if you're honest, probably much better position to discuss this than I am. But, but that's my understanding. So, you know, you've, we've really got to bring price into it. And bottom line is, as we've already heard, that some of this, um, some of this uh, shale gas is cheap. Um, the other point I'd like to make, we live in a competitive world. The biggest reserves of shale gas are in China, if you believe uh, you know, what's known at the moment. And you know, watch that economy, watch, watch them go for that. I was in China 10 days ago, and the news articles were about the licenses being allocated in China to take that forward. So you know, maybe, maybe external competition will also have some impact on our political leadership. But that's not a view of the Royal Academy of Engineering or the Royal Society, I should say again. <laughs> In the, in the US, the, basically the Environment uh, Protection Agency ask, requires actually every uh, service company what chemicals they're using for fracks. Although it's kind of, you know, it's a difference between, you know, the ingredients for the recipe and actually knowing how to make the cake. So Halliburton, Schlumberger, the companies that do this and develop the chemicals, they won't tell you how they put it together or they won't tell the competitors, but you actually have to list out every single chemical. So what actually happened is... Um, this was a big issue for several years, and the industry was a little bit on the back foot. They, they developed with an environmental organization, frackfocus.org, and any citizen could go in there, wherever you sit on the web, and actually type in the name of the well, and it would tell you exactly what the chemicals are being used there. Most states actually demand that you actually have to, you know, sort of tell what chemicals are involved there, so there's full disclosure. UK has a similar thing, so that deals with that area. Just one other, there was another question about renewables as well. I mean, you know, gas isn't the answer for everything, and, you know, like it or not, you know, you do need a bit of everything. You need everything in the mix, but gas is, you know, it's a great backup tool. It's got 50% lower CO2 emissions when you burn it for producing electricity than coal, and also it has, you can turn it off and on pretty quickly compared to a coal itself. So it does have that backup ability compared to offshore windmills and other alternatives as well. So it should be seen in the sense that it's a bridge between now and actually getting a real, you know, low-carbon future. Just on this uh, NIMBY uh, question, um, just because I've described the problem uh, of NIMBYism doesn't mean that I agree with NIMBYism. Um, I personally, I think it's a, it's a disgrace, the fact that we can't get anything uh, uh, infrastructural uh, built in this country from houses which are desperately needed to uh, uh, rail links, uh, uh, recycling plants, anything. Um, and how do you deal with that? Well, I think that you need uh, to elect politicians who've got some guts uh, and who've got some bravery and are prepared uh, to take this on. I think, uh, you know, the, the chances of, of uh, getting that, um, well, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, but um, th this question on uh, re renewables, um, uh, investment in gas does uh, reduce uh, investment uh, in renewables. It creates uh, uncertainty and uh, it becomes more difficult for people who want to build renewables uh, to actually uh, get the investment uh, that they need. Um, and we've seen that very clearly uh, lately. Um, I went, uh, earlier this year, I went and talked to uh, all the companies that were going to put in wind, wind turbine manufacturing plants in this country uh, that would be tens of billions of pounds of investment and create thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, and they were holding back 
uh, on that investment because uh, the government was talking up gas so much. Um, and that's very difficult. The jobs that are created by shale gas, yes, there would be some jobs uh, from that. Uh, but let me just give you the example from uh, the, my experience up in Lancashire. I talked to people who were working uh, on the, uh, uh, the uh, drilling there. Um, they were uh, a team uh, that uh, had just come. They, 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 uh, the latest place they'd been, in fact, was, uh, was in the Middle East. Uh, and they move around the world uh, kind of doing this. These are not really local jobs uh, for local people. Um, and uh, the only person uh, that I could find uh, in the village who'd benefited economically was the landlord of the local pub, uh, who was delighted that these, uh, these drill workers uh, would come in uh, after their shifts. Um, when I went back a few months later, and as I said, it was just a, a little shed in the field, uh, I went into the pub again, and uh, I asked the landlord, how's business? And uh, he was extremely grumpy. He said, well, all the drillers have gone. There's nothing left but a hole in the ground. No one's coming in anymore. Um, so we have to be aware that, uh, that the, uh, the benefits in terms of jobs uh, of this uh, might not always be uh, as great as they seem. Okay. Thank you to all three of you.